So, this, con this conference okay. will now be recorded. I feel like I'm in the airport and the, the voice just keeps talking. Um, so Chair Taylor is going to be taking care of our minutes and everything. I just want everyone to know that. So if you're wondering, where is Amanda? Um, she is not going to be with us. Thank you, Director Jacoby. Okay. Are you ready? We'll give it just one more minute and stop at the start at the top of the hour. All right, well, I have 9 a.m., so I will um, introduce myself. Good morning, I'm Lindsay Laird, and I would like to call the Oklahoma Commission on Children and Youth meeting to order. It's March 12th, 2021, and it's 9 a.m. Ms. Taylor, would you please call roll so we can establish quorum? Yes, ma'am. Secretary Brown? Secretary Corbett? Uh, Commissioner Aaron? Commissioner Aaron? Commissioner Front? Here. Dr. Fry? Commissioner Hall? Here. Commissioner Harrington? Here. Superintendent Hoffmeister? Commissioner Holt? Here. Dr. Kurth? Present. Commissioner Laird? Present. Uh, District Attorney Marcy? Present. Commissioner Myers? Present. Commissioner Schneider? Here. Commissioner Slatton Hodges? Here. Judge Warren? Here. Commissioner Wilson? Here. We have quorum. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. I'd like to welcome our newest commissioners, Jenna Ree Harrington and Brad Wilson. We're glad to have you on the commission. In order to make this uh, virtual meeting a little more personal, I'd like to um, go through introductions, starting with the commissioners. I will call you by name and ask you to introduce yourself and the role in which you serve on the commission. So I'll start, start with Commissioner Front. Good morning, Melinda Front. I'm the Executive Director of the Department of Rehabilitation Services. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Slatton Hodges. Good morning, Carrie Slatton Hodges. I am the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Judge Warren. I'm Mike Warren. I'm a judge of the district court. I represent the Supreme Court and I chair the Juvenile Justice Oversight Advisory Committee. Thank you. Director Holt. I am Rachel Holt. I'm the executive director for the Office of Juvenile Affairs. Commissioner Harrington. Hi, I'm Jennery Harrington. I'm the vice president of programs with Circle of Care. Commissioner Aaron. Commissioner, we can't hear you. It shows you're off mute. Still not working. We'll come back to you, but we'll continue. 
Um, Commissioner Schneider. Hey, uh, John Schneider. I'm the executive director at Youth and Family Services in El Reno and also representing the Association of Youth Services uh, on this board as the secretary currently. Thank you. Commissioner Myers. Yes, my name is Brenda Myers. I am the director of the Comanche County Juvenile Bureau and the director of the Comanche County Juvenile Detention Center. I serve as representing the juvenile bureaus. Thank you. Commissioner Wilson. Hi, good morning. I'm Brad Wilson. I'm an attorney in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and I am on the commission representing the Oklahoma Bar Association. We're glad to have you. Commissioner Hall. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Hall. I'm the managing principal of Warburton Capital here in Tulsa, and um, I'm representing business and industry for Oklahoma. Thank you. DA Marcy. Good morning. I'm Angela Marcy. I'm the district attorney for District 2, which includes Custer, Beckham, Washita, Roger Mills, and Ellis counties. I represent the Oklahoma District Attorneys Association. Thank you. Dr. Kurth. Hello, I'm Kaylee Kurth. I represent the Post Adjudication Review Board as a foster parent with an agency. Thank you. Commissioner Aaron, let's give this another try. No, I'm afraid we cannot. Commissioner Aaron is with CASA of Western Oklahoma. And we're glad to have her. If it, if it comes back on, we'll, we'll come back around to you. Thank you all. And I am um, Lindsay Laird. I, I work for the Arnall Family Foundation, but I am appointed to the um, Oklahoma Commission on Children and Youth by Senate Pro Tem Greg Treat as a member with demonstrated interest in improving children's services who is not employed by a state agency nor um, a private organization receiving state funds. It's the longest um, title ever. Is that all of the commissioners? Okay. Uh, I would like to ask the hardworking staff at OCCY to introduce themselves, and I will um, ask that you also share your role with the commission, and I will call you by name. Let's start with you, uh, Ms. Taylor. Hi, I'm Chair Taylor. I am the office coordinator with OCCY. Thank you. Mr. James. Good morning. I'm Mark James. I'm the assistant director with the OGCY. I think we see you in the corner there. Thank you. Director Jacoby. Good morning. I'm Annette Jacoby and I am the director here at OCCY. Thank you. Ms. Rhodes. She's in the small conference room. It may not, oh, she may not be able to be connected. Okay. Let's move on to uh, Ms. Deal. Good morning. My name is Danielle Deal, and I serve as the program manager for the Office of Planning and Coordination. Excellent. Thank you. And Ms. Lisa Rhodes is the program manager for the Child Death Review Board. Uh, Mr. Whittefield. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jimmy Whittefield, Jr. I'm the program manager for the Freestanding Multidisciplinary Teams Department. Thank you. Mr. Agnew. Hi, I'm Rob Agnew. I'm the Public Information Officer for OCCY. Thank you. Ms. Elder. Good morning. Um, I am Project Coordinator for the OCCY Parent Partnership Board. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lawrence. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Lorenz. Lorenz. And my name is Ellen. I work for OCCY in the Planning and Coordination Office. Thank you. Mr. Pirtle? Hi, Keith Pirtle. I'm the Program Manager for the Post Adjudication Review Boards where we support, protect, and monitor the deprived court system. Very important. Thank you. Ms. Kopp? Good morning. I'm Liz Kopp, Case Manager with the Child Death Review Board. Thank you. And Ms. Hardin. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Hardin, and I'm the legislative liaison for the Commission on Children and Youth. 
Thank you. Did I miss any other staff with OCCY before we move on to guests? Hi there, this is McGrath. I handle the data entry and quality control and reporting our information to the National Fatality Review System. Thank you, Mr. McGrath. Hi, this is Good Amanda morning. Everett from the Attorney General's Office. I'm counsel to OCCY. I'm on I called in from a phone number, so you might not see me, but good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Ms. Everett. Good morning. It's Gina Pendergraf. I am a supervisor with the Office of Juvenile Systems Oversight. Thank you, Ms. Pendergraft. Anybody else? Great. Thank you to each of you for the work you do. I'd like to move on. Oh, anybody else? Okay, we'll um, move on to guests at this point. Um, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourselves, the organization um, that you're with and um, or uh, what brings you here today. So I'm gonna be kind of looking through our list here. Um, well, we have uh, Ms. Bame, who is with OMES. Ms. Bame? Yes, I'm Brandy Bame. I'm the financial manager um, that works with OCCY, and I'm here in place of Letitia today. Thank you. We'll hear from Ms. Bame a little, in a little bit. Um, Commissioner Bloomert. Good morning. I'm Commissioner Carrie Bloomer. I'm a county commissioner here in Oklahoma County and I represent District 1. Thank you for your engagement. Um, Ms. Beth Martin. Good morning. I'm Beth Martin with uh, the Oklahoma State Department of Health, Family Support and Prevention Services, and we house the Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Thank you. Brianna Bailey, welcome. Thank you. Do you want to introduce um, the publication you're with, Brianna? I don't think we can hear you. Brianna, I believe you're with, uh, just promoted to editor of The Frontier. We're glad to have you. And I mentioned before the meeting, Brianna, um, Rob Agnew is our PIO and would be happy to answer any questions you have. His contact information is in the chat. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, I, Michael, Mr. Michael Huesca. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Huesca, and I am a consultant with the National Alliance for Children's Trust Fund. I am calling in from San Diego, California. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Miss um, Sherry Fair. Good morning. I'm Sherry Fair, and I'm the executive director of Parent Promise Prevent Child Abuse Oklahoma. Thank you. Roseanne Doplin. Duplin. Good morning. I'm Roseanne Duplan and I'm the public policy specialist for Oklahoma Disability Law Center and we are the protection and advocacy agency for Oklahoma. Thank you. Let's do, did we, did Meryl Levine? Levine? Good morning. My name is Meryl Levine and I'm happy to be here. I am a senior associate with the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. I will be part of a, a presentation this morning. We're really excited to be here. And I'm from the Los Angeles area. Thank you, we're glad to have you. Yeah. Regina Moon. Yes, thank you. Regina Moon, CEO of the Parent Child Center over here in Tulsa, the lead prevention agency. Hi, Regina, good to see you. Former commissioner, Wanda Felty. Hi, I'm Wanda Felty. I work at the Center for Learning and Leadership, which is Oklahoma's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disability. I'm also a parent of an adult child with disabilities. Good to see you, Wanda. Thank you for your continued engagement. Um, Mr. Dan Cowan. Good morning, I'm Dan Cohen with Casey Family Programs. I'm a strategic consultant assigned to Oklahoma. We're based out of Seattle, but I'm coming to you today from my home in Michigan. Thank you, Dan. Ms. Amy Emerson. Amy, you may be on mute.
Amy is the interim director for the Oklahoma Partnership for School Readiness Foundation. Mr. Joe Dorman. Joe Dorman, CEO for the Oklahoma Institute for Child Advocacy. Thank you, Joe. Ms. Megan Wiss. Megan, it was a, a little jarbled, but I think we heard Department of Human Services and I couldn't make out the rest. Does anybody else, um, could anybody else make that out? Okay, Department of Human Services, Megan, we're glad to have you. Um, I, did we have Ellen, was um, was that Ellen Lorenz or is this enough? That is, okay, thank you. Um, Miss Betty Hawkins. Hi, I'm Betty Hawkins Emery. I have been involved with the Oklahoma uh, Commission on Children and Youth as a parent liaison for a number of months now. And I'm here in the great state of Oklahoma. Thank you, Betty. We're so glad you're here. I think that was everybody. We have a caller for, um, if you could identify yourself and introduce who you are. My name is Linda Loggins. I'm an individual and I live here in Oklahoma. Great. Thank you, Brenda. I was wondering if that was you. Did I miss anybody else on today? Okay, we all know one another. Great. Um, thank you to our guest who is here today to offer public comment. And as I mentioned before um, the meeting, public comments are allotted for three minutes and uh, there will be a one minute warning in the chat provided. We do have one person who has signed up for public comment and that is Miss um, Brenda Loggins. So Miss Loggins, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you. I spoke about a year ago by phone addressing systemic racism. At that time, I asked for needed changes in a specific agency. However, the changes apply to all agencies. I was feeling emotional due to ongoing and recent happenings that had been the most horrific and heartbreaking things I had seen in my entire life. Perhaps you heard the emotion in my voice as you were on the call and experienced some of your own related to mine or what was happening at that time. So much has happened since that call. And over the last year and into the first quarter of this year, which has impacted all of our lives in many ways. To all of you who have lost family and friends due to COVID-19 or other illnesses and injuries, I am so sorry for your loss. And I extend my deepest sympathy. I am praying for renewed hope for humanity, America, and the world. I want to speak directly to a problem. Last month was Black History Month, but for many Blacks, every month is Black History Month. The problem, discrimination in those who are perpetuated of discrimination. And my question is, is anyone on this call 400 years old? My answer is, I know none of us are 400 years old in age, but the problem, discrimination, and those who are perpetuated of discrimination was born and indoctrinated in our mindset attitudes and behaviors, kept alive and brought forth in generations and traditions dating back 400 years ago in slavery of black people. Beware, the world we live in has influence over our thinking that we're not fully aware of. A person can do anti-discriminatory work and also produce discriminatory ideals in work and daily life. Discrimination is structural. It's part of Oklahoma and America's past and present. Manifested in personal ways. We have endured a number of recent events that have provided us with opportunities to grow in our character. As leaders, we must confront the problem, discrimination in those who are perpetuators of discrimination. Also, engage in purposeful, and intentional education and training for equality and justice for all. My hope today is that as a leader, you will be encouraged, inspired, motivated, and activated to lead with purpose and intentional resolve as never before to rid the workplace of the problem of discrimination and those who are perpetuators of discrimination. Also, to be a committed 
humble human being serving in a leadership position, taking on the critical and challenging issues while holding truth that all men are created equal and we are better together creating a top 10 state, a world of peace, equality, and justice for all. I thank you so much, and I ask that each of you please stay safe and well and get vaccinated. My name is Brenda Loggins. My number is 405-412-1013. My email address is Brenda, J as in Jack, Loggins, like the senior Kenny Loggins, at Outlook.com. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Loggins. We have a couple of callers who have arrived. Um, I would like to ask caller five, if you would um, identify yourself and the organization that you're with. Okay, caller five. I don't know if oh, caller six, that is you. Yes, welcome. Caller six, would you please introduce yourself? I don't know if I'm caller six, but this is Kevin Corbett. It is, thank you, Commissioner Corbett. We're glad to have you. Would thank you me. introduce yourself? Yes, Kevin Corbett. I am the CEO of the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority and I also serve as the Secretary of Health and Mental Health. Glad you could join. All right, moving on to agenda item number four, we have um, the review and approval of the December 11th Special Commission meeting minutes. The meeting minutes were provided in your packet. Um, I noticed one edit, which is under staff present. I believe it should be Adrian Elder, and there's an S at the end of her name. So Adrian Elders is how it's reflected. So we need to amend that to Elder. Are there any other amendments to the meeting minutes? Okay, if there are no other Amendments. I will entertain a motion to approve the December 11th meeting minutes. Make a motion to accept the uh, meeting minutes. Mike Warren, second. Any final discussion? All right. Ms. Taylor, please take the vote. Okay. Secretary Corbett? Yes. Commissioner Aaron? Uh, she said yes in the chat. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Front? Commissioner Front? Come back. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hall? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Dr. Kurth? Yes. Commissioner Laird? Yes. District Attorney Marcy? Yes. Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Snyder? Yes. Commissioner Slatton Hodges? Yes. Judge Warren? Yes. And Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, I also show that uh, Enrique Carrillo just joined the, the meeting. Would you introduce yourself, please? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Enrique Carrillo, and I work for um, Kerry, Commissioner Kerry Bloomert's office. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Thank you. All right. Agenda item number five, moving on, we have a presentation and approval of the finance report from Ms. Brandy Baim. Ms. Um, Baim. Good morning. Um, on our first page here on the budget to actuals report, um, we have an annual budget of, and you'll have to excuse me, um, I haven't 
done this one before, so if I get tongue tied, I apologize. But we have five million four hundred twenty nine thousand two hundred and twenty three dollars in budget. To date, we have spent two million one hundred sixty six thousand five hundred ninety three dollars in a penny. Um, we have encumbered the encumbrance and expenditure total is two million five hundred nineteen thousand and ninety two cents. Um, so we have about half our budget left with um, about that much to go um, on our cash, the ABC report. Um, we have no carryover left. We have just over a million in our appropriations and about seven hundred sixty-eight thousand seventy-two dollars fifty-three cents in our revolving fund which is the 200 fund and the 210, which is the MDTs, we have about $189,266.78 remaining. Um, we had a lot of those pay out in January. Um, on the SRD report, which is the summary of receipts and disbursements, um, we had our appropriations come in for the 191,280, yeah, two hundred eighty-five dollars, um, and that's been about it for the S for the summary of receipts and disbursements, I believe. I think that's it. Are there any questions? Any questions from our um, commissioners? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the finance report? So moved. Thank you, Judge Warren. Do I hear a second? This is second. Brad Wilson. I'll second. Brad Wilson, second. Any final discussion? All right, we'll take the vote. Thank you. Secretary Corbett? Yes. Commissioner Aaron? Commissioner Aaron? She okay. said yes in chat. Okay. Commissioner Front? Yes. Commissioner Hall? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Dr. Kurth? Yes. Commissioner Laird? Yes. District Attorney Marcy? Yes. Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Schneider? Yes. Commissioner Slatton Hodges? Yes. Judge Warren? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, moving on to agenda item number six, election of officers for our commissioners who were here during our last meeting in December. You recall that we um, elected a new slate of officers, which included Mr. Javier Ramirez as vice chair and Commissioner Snyder as secretary. Um, shortly after that meeting, I learned that Mr. Ramirez was not reappointed to the commission, leaving the vice chair seat open. Um, so at that point, I formed an ad hoc committee, uh, nominating committee consisting of Commissioner Front, Director Holt, and myself. We would like to put a slate of officers forward for to the commission for consideration. That slate moves Commissioner Snyder from secretary to vice chair and nominates Dr. Kurth to secretary. At this time, I'd like to open it up for other nominations from the floor. Not all at once. <laughs> okay. If there are no other nominations, I will entertain a motion um, for the vice chair position. 
This is Commissioner Front. Um, I move uh, we accept the nominations as uh, presented. Mike Warren, second. I believe we need to do individually. Um, so could we um, okay. Sorry. do the motion? Just no, That's fine for um, vice chair. Okay, I move to accept uh, the vice chair as presented. Thank you. And a second? I Second. Thank you, Marcy. Any final discussion? Okay. Let's do the vote. Secretary Corbett? Yes. Commissioner Aaron? Okay. Commissioner Front? Yes. Commissioner Hall? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Dr. Kurth? Yes. Commissioner Laird? Yes. District Attorney Marcy? Yes. Commissioner Myers? Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Snyder? Yes. Commissioner Slatton Hodges? Yes. Judge Warren? Yes. And Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. I want to confirm that you got Commissioner Aaron's vote as a yes. She placed it in the chat. Yes, I got that. Thank you. Congratulations. Commissioner Schneider, you are vice chair. Um, at this point, I will entertain a motion for secretary. Commissioner Front, I move um, nomination, or excuse me, to accept the nomination as presented for secretary. I, think he's I second it. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Harrington, with the second. We'll take the vote. Okay. okay. Uh, Secretary Corbett? Yes. Commissioner Aaron? Uh, Commissioner Front? Yes. Commissioner Hall? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Dr. Kurth? Abstain. Commissioner Laird? Yes. District Attorney Marcy? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Myers? Yes. Commissioner Snyder? Yes. Commissioner Slatton Hodges? Yes. Judge Warren? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Kurth. Moving on to agenda item number seven, we have commission subcommittee structure and meeting dates. Um, we have four standing subcommittees with the Oklahoma Commission on Children and Youth. Um, a detailed description of each of those subcommittees was included in your meeting packet. I will be the first to admit that these have not been particularly active subcommittees with the exception of finance, but moving forward, I believe the work of the subcommittees is crucial to the commission um, functioning at optimum effectiveness. So Ms. Jett will, uh, Ms. Amanda Jett will be emailing the list of committees as well as who is currently signed up for which committees to each commissioner. And if you're not currently signed up for a subcommittee, I ask that you please sign up for at least one, but feel free to sign up for more than one. Once everyone is signed up for committees, um, subcommittees, Ms. Jett will circulate calendar meeting invitations um, for each subcommittee. So those subcommittees include personnel, finance, legislative, and then finally planning and coordination. 
I, for one, am on planning and coordination, and I'm very excited to, get to work uh, with our new program manager, Ms. Danielle Dill, on planning and coordination. Do we have any questions or comments about the subcommittees? Um, this is uh, Commissioner Slatton Hodges. I have a question. Is it um, possible to <clears throat> assign a staff person to a committee, or does it need to be the actual uh, commissioner? That's a great question. One has never been asked before. My opinion would be that um, a staff person would be appropriate. Um, Director Jacoby, do you have an alternate opinion on that? I don't know we've ever thought about that. So um, if you like the idea, I say we do it. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions or comments about the subcommittees? Okay, moving right along to agenda item number eight, presentation to OCCY about the Parent Partnership Board. I, for one, am extremely excited about our next presentation. Um, following the passage of Senate Bill 1081 in 2018, which created the Oklahoma Children's Trust, Trust Fund, we've been talking about the Parent Partnership Board since that time. Incorporating the voices of individuals with lived experience into the commission's programming, our child serving agencies, and eventually the trust fund is a critical piece of equity. And I'm excited to give the floor to Ms. Adrian Elder and her co-presenters to update us on their efforts. Ms. Elder. Good morning. I am going to pull up my screen. Let me make some adjustments. You can see some. There you go. You won't be able to see uh, <laughs> my my screensaver. There you go. Um, so um, I will turn it over to Annette to kick us off and do some introductions. All right, I just want to um, echo, this is, uh, I hope, why a few of you extra guests are joining us today, because I think this is a very exciting piece of work that's coming forward and through OCCY, and I have to tell you, I really see this as a culture change for our organization. So I am happy to say that with us, we have Adrian Elder. If you recall, we hired Adrian as a part-time employee to help us get this off the ground. Uh, we are very short staffed, so it's very helpful to have outside people who can come in, share their expertise, and assist us in getting some of these items uh, up and elevated and moving forward. Uh, the next person on the list is Betty Hawkins, and some of you may remember Betty's been a parent that attends our meetings. Uh, she has helped us with public comment for rules, rulemaking. Uh, she is involved highly at both the state and national level and parent leadership. And we're very excited to have her with us. And then we have Meryl Levine. And Meryl, I'm so glad these poor folks on the West Coast, Meryl and Michael have joined us at early hours, even showed up early for this meeting. So I'm just telling you, we are, we are delighted to have you join us. Meryl is uh, an expert when it comes to really empowering people, helping them hone their experiences and then be able to share them and make use of them for a, a much broader platform. So we're very happy to have Meryl and her expertise. And last but not least is Michael Weska, and uh, he introduced himself earlier, but Michael is a leader not only in parent leadership, but also in father engagement and father leadership. So I'm very, very happy about um, sharing this work with you. Um, Adrian, I think, I don't know if I can move slides, but if you could move to the next slide. I'm going to quickly just um, uh, go off a little script here on this key takeaways because I'm going to tell you the mantra on the handout that we sent to you, nothing about us without us has got to be the way we move forward. Okay. And um, I am very excited about this notion that uh, OCCY wants to really be a leader on not only asking parents for input, and trying desperately to value and make a, a spot for them that's meaningful and useful. But I'm gonna tell you, I really think it's important that before we build things, before we implement things, before we go seek out solutions, we need to ask and listen. 
And I have to say, I have been in the field for 25, 30 years now. And I admit that I have spent a lot of time doing top-down work. I think that it is only successful to some point. I know that Oklahoma has spent a lot of energy in implementing evidence-based practices and done outstanding work in a lot of ways. But I can't even think through my experiences if we ever asked if people wanted what we were implementing first. Often we learned about something and it was great at a conference or we learned about something after doing some research. I have to give kudos to, I think, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services because I think they have led this way for, oh my gosh, years, if not decades, and to me have really been at the forefront. And OCCY is late to the party, but we are going to uh, jump in with gusto. So um, please, please, please um, embrace this. And I say, I'm going to say embrace the tension and the uncomfortableness that may come with it. It will make things perhaps slower because when you have to bring people on board with you and work through everyone's perspectives, it just kind of makes it a little slower. But I think it also means that your, your success is more sustainable. So look for OCCY not only to have this broad, broad, diverse uh, group of parents um, providing input. And, and when I say broad, we're talking about someone from the prevention field who may have once utilized a service um, from someone who may have already had or may have had their rights terminated. This is not purely child welfare driven. It is not about one path. It's about all parents, because any of us who have been a parent know we had a lot, we had to have a lot of help. Um, we, we need to normalize that. So we want a broad swath of parents. We will be reaching out to you to help us in the application process. But honestly, I just want to tell you that um, we're going to really embrace this at OCCY and in all of our work. And we hope that um, we can assist you in that as well. So I'm going to turn this over and turn it back to, I'm not sure who the next person is, but um, we're very, very happy to be doing this. So thanks. So thank you, Annette. And, and again, my name is Mary Levine. I'm a senior associate with the Children's Trust Fund Alliance. And I'm so pleased to be here this morning with all of you. Um, we are a national technical assistance provider that helps organizations in terms of developing parent advisory councils and different kinds of structures so that we really can maximize the voices of parents and help them in terms of developing policies, practices, and services that are going to best meet the needs of children and families. And so we're excited to be here with you in Oklahoma, and, I, and we really want to commend you for your commitment to really wanting to engage both parent and consumer voice in areas like this, in decisions that you're going to be making around improving policies and practices. So in terms of getting started right now, we wanted to kind of explain how we are defining what we're calling parent partnership. We thought it would be a, a helpful beginning point for you and, and make sure that we're all on the same page. Parent partnership and through our work and experiences with the Children's Trust Fund work that we have been doing, everyone from leadership, supervisors, staff, are all agreeing to work in partnership with parents together in a meaningful and an authentic kind of way. It's through planning of a program, implementation, oversight, evaluation. So it's really coming and happening from beginning to end so that you really are involving parent voice in all that you're doing related to the development and policies and practices for children and families. The parents that we are referring to, as Annette was talking about earlier, are parents who are really experts. They know, they have the knowledge and the expertise around what families really need and what are the gaps in terms of services. Um, we've seen that these kinds of partnerships work the best when the staff and the leadership are able to provide a structure. So again, this kind of a parent partnership board is going to be critical in order to support the voices of parents, help with training, technical assistance, and helping them be able to reach out to more parents all across Oklahoma. And now I'd like to turn the 
the uh, program over to Betty Hawkins for her to share a little bit of her perspective. Betty? Thank you, Merle. And again, nothing about us without us. I am Betty Hawkins Emery. Don't be worried. You don't have to refer to me with that long title. Most people just call me Miss Betty. And I have been involved with the, the commission in the position of parent liaison. I have seen what the commission does, and I am excited about bringing the parent voice into the next level. You all have a unique opportunity to have your finger on the pulse of the communities, rural and urban, all across this great state of Oklahoma. Bringing the parent voice into the implementation and the development of policies to assure that they are purposeful and productive. Each department here already has a relationship with the people it serves. Now is the opportunity, and it exists right now, to have a human analysis of how these services are contributing to the well being of your particular clientele. In that sense, it is imperative that nothing about us. It's done without us. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. And and why I wanted to just kind of highlight for everyone, this is Merrill again. Why would you want to consider partnering with parents? And I hope Betty has kind of shared with you more in terms of what it really means when you include parents in the decisions that you're making. But we at the Alliance have done a lot of work in terms of parents and we've, and we've documented a lot of the benefits of working with parents and we've done multiple publications and you'd be able to access all of those materials on our website. But just to give you an idea, I'm, I'm a longtime social worker by background and I've worked with families in prevention services, juvenile justice, resources, child welfare, and, and, and throughout all of the work that I've done, I've learned some incredible, uh, valuable uh, information through parents. They really are able to tell you what works and doesn't work in the kinds of services that we develop in, in, in areas for them. So it's really going to be critical and, again, um, to look to the voices of parents to help in providing different kinds of perspectives. There's not just one family in Oklahoma. There's all different kinds of diverse families. So it's also critical that we look at how those services are developed based on the different needs that the families do have. But based on our experience in terms of talking with parents and gaining more information about what has happened, we've seen parents taking on major leadership types of roles in different states. They've taken on mentorship types of roles so that they can help other parents access resources, learn about different kinds of parenting strategies. If we've helped in terms of expanding social networks when we get parents involved, greater employment opportunities as well as educational opportunities have happened for families when we include them. Improved communication between service providers and parents. Increased referrals and use of services is also an outcome that, that comes in terms of partnering with parents. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'd like to now turn it over to Michael Weska um, to talk a little bit more about how do you work in partnership? Michael? Thank you, Meryl. Good, good afternoon, I believe it is, for where you all are coming from. Um, you know, I, I want to first off say that I was a, a parent who never had an open case, but my involvement spanned over two years and 27 investigations by the child welfare system. I was a single father with a five-year-old son 20 plus years ago, because my son's now 26. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> so 
you know, what, what does authentic engagement look like? Well, it really is what Annette was talking about earlier. It was really, it's really about getting parents' voices involved. And across the country, and I've been blessed to be a part of over 19 states working with leadership. In fact, uh, coincidentally, I happen to be working with your own, very own Dr. Deb uh, on the Family First Prevention Services Plan. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, I was part of those parents who helped co-author that Family First Prevention Services Act with Senator Wyden and Senator Hatch. And that was the start of something very incredible because it was a piece of legislation that actually included their parents' voices. And when you think about that, you kind of have to step back because that's not the way we've done things for so long. Earlier, the caller talked about the racial disproportionalities. Well, you know, the systems often target the most vulnerable people. And they don't often ask, what can we do differently? Imagine for just a second that you were told by a colleague you weren't feeling well, or you didn't look good. And so you went home and you thought, you know what, I'm really not feeling well. So you go to the doctor, the next day, you walk in, the doctor says, good morning, and you start to talk to the doctor and he says, oh, hold on. And all of a sudden he writes your prescription and says, have a good day. Believe it or not, that's what families feel when they deal with public systems. Families feel like they're just getting a prescription and they never have the opportunity to share what's really going on with them. And that happens across systems. And as Annette said, you know, this movement has been going on for a little while. And she said that you guys are a little bit late to the party. Well, I would challenge you and suggest that you're gonna be ahead of the game because one thing that you guys have intentionally planned to do, or at least with Annette's directions, is to incorporate cross systems. The data shows us that families don't just go into child welfare, they use multiple systems. And so if you guys are bringing together leadership voices of parents across systems, you will be ahead of the game. And that is a solution oriented focus that I don't think any other state, at least not one that I'm working on with, has been doing before. And think about the brilliance behind that because so often, you know, parents talk to other parents we need each other and you know as miss betty said nothing about us without us wow that's an incredible model meryl we're turning it to you adrian great well um so my name is Adrienne Elder, and you know, as project coordinator um, for this for this effort, just honored to uh, work and learn um, with Annette and Merrill and Michael and Betty and Amber and Lashonda and Danielle has been kind of all part of this uh, planning group. And my background is public health, um, and so I love systems thinking and systems change. And as this has really become right, the cross-sector collaboration, looking at how we um, integrate family voice to improve uh, services across Oklahoma. Um, I love this visual um, because it is, it really shows how we can amplify uh, diverse family voices uh, with lived experience. And we have to create very intentional spaces um, to integrate their voice into um, each of our organizations and commissions and task force. And that can be done with uh, this kind of national best practice model of um, advisory councils, and advisory committees where uh, parents and staff are building leadership skills together, um, increasing that, that trust and respect with each other uh, so that uh, services can be more coordinated. Um, for example, at Family Resource Centers, um, Oklahoma is doing a great job um, with the community hope centers that are going up across um, the state and how uh, other family resource centers can be, uh, can be incorporated into, into our work. 
Um, the next is, you know, as these uh, services are more coordinated and they're, you know, local and statewide coalitions, um, this is a great opportunity for listening to the uh, parent voice about what are the, the highest needs and how we can collaborate on cross-sector trainings, whether that's becoming more trauma-informed, and um, how we incorporate diversity, um, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. Um, and then we are able to use our public and private funding more efficiently. We're able to increase access with more informed policies. And so this is just a, a great way of creating a very intentional pipeline and infrastructure within our state. Um, again, at the the right, the heart and the pulse of our community are are the families and are the parents who can help lead this effort. So, um, these are just some of the many examples um, of how parents can work uh, with commissioners, and and wanted to um, share this um, moment with with Betty, and you know if she would like to highlight. Um, a couple of these, and then I can also add a few of these. So, Ms. Betty, would you like to highlight a few? Sure. Um, I believe that one of the main goals for this parent partnership board is to play an instrumental role in hearing and elevating information to the commission and letting them hear the way that these policies affect the children as I said again, keeping a finger on the pulse of the clientele that you serve. I would like for you to uh, make this image in your mind of walking with the children across the, these systems to provide productive and purposeful uh, policies that contribute to the well being of the children. Back to you, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Betty. Um, you know, and, and this kind of list um, is just a, a quick sampling. Um, but again, you know, as we keep kind of emphasizing and encouraging this kind of in, this uh, opportunity and unique opportunity really for Oklahoma uh, to increase that coordination of services, um, how that parent voice can help with um, our strategic planning um, improving our policies and practices, um, how we reach out to parents through uh, not only brochures, but really meaningful engagement, uh, like Michael said, um, listening to the stories, listening to their experiences, um, because that will bring the data to life, um, that will inspire staff uh, to, to make changes and leadership to make the changes that are uh, most important and help prioritize that. Um, the other two um, that wanted to, to really highlight are these bottom two, um, is that how you know, parents, as they take, a, take on more leadership roles um, in their community, that they are able to mentor and, and coach other parents, um, but also be co-trainers um, within an organization that you know, brings those stories to life and, and helps to uh, bring that parent perspective um, into trainings um, so that you know those those uh, those trainings are are more meaningful and have a, have a, a better impact. So as we uh, create this uh, parent partnership board, um, I, I know we've uh, had several terms to this. There's parent partnership boards. There's parent advisory councils. Um, but the the main the main uh, kind of steps to create one is you want to have a planning group which includes parents. So from the very beginning, uh, we are learning and working with each other. Uh, we're developing that, that trust and that re those relationships. So we encourage um, you all as you um, embed this in your work to do the same. Um, we have a designated uh, staff person. We're determining our, our budget and seeing how we can coordinate funding um, across agencies, um, how we can really be intentional with recruitment and selection so that uh, the commission can be uh, the most effective and have a, a diverse representation from across our state with a diverse um, experiences as well. Uh, we will hold um, an orientation meeting and trainings. Uh, we will have uh, regular meetings 
Uh, we will provide ind individual coaching and support, and then really just track how we are um, providing support for long-term success and sustainability, and really be part using that evaluation to uh, to track um, the improvement of outcomes for children and families across um, across the state. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Michael and Merrill. Thanks, Adrian. And and I just really wanted to reiterate real quickly for you the importance of having a structure like a parent partnership board, because that's the way that we can give the parents the needed support, training, technical assistance, so that they can really use their voice in the most effective way and they can get information out to the public as well as consult with all of the commissioners around what are the needs and issues that families are facing. So uh, I hope that this has given you a little bit of an idea. Michael, I don't know whether you want to add another comment or two, but I do think the, the board structure is a critical structure to have in place in order to support this kind of work. Michael? Yeah, I, I think you said it all. I just want to let you all know that the data shows us that this is working. The data is what's driving these this movement right now. And the truth of the matter is, is that nationally, 63% of our children in foster care are there for neglect. And when that translates down, it's really linked to poverty. So we have to really think about this. This is an opportunity, as Ms. Betty said, to walk hand in hand with children and families. This is an opportunity to stop throwing kids into a system that doesn't work, but to really just walk hand in hand with these families so that they can truly thrive. And this is um, back to you, Annette. All right. Well, I know that we're kind of coming to a close, and I just want to say that um, we really do want you to find use of this parent partnership board. We created it to inform you as a collective, uh, should we ever have a need or um, have money in our trust fund or have some issues where you want some some feedback and they are they will be available to you however i really want you to think about ways that you can maybe utilize them for your own agency or own purpose um, because i really want these families these caregivers these parents to feel like this is meaningful valuable and authentic work this is not a check the box we hit we now have a parent partnership board look at us um, I really want this to be transformative. I am a, 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 a diehard now. I think I've sat in so many meetings lately where uh, I have been so moved by folks and their need to voice how they believe their community is functioning and what they wish they had. And it just kind of breaks your heart when you really listen to what families are saying and they are crying out for a place to say it. And I can't think of a better place than the commission. Um, and when I say the commission, I mean you in particular as commissioners, because you're the leaders and the people who can make the decisions and the influencers. And so while you may have your own groups that inform your work for your pathway and your goals for your agency or system, I really want this to be something where you can say, I, I forget <laughs> that, that juvenile justice also crosses with um, you know DHS, and I know you don't really forget Director Holt, but um, that, that there are these cross systems uh, intersections and that collectively we can do so much more than just trying to fix our own little problems in our own little world. So uh, truly, truly, truly um, think about ways to engage uh, with this work. We're gonna keep you posted. This will probably be a standing agenda item, even if it's a short report from now on, and then once we have the board up and running, look for this to be a standing agenda item um, so that they can tell you what they're engaged in and, and provide you with the, the needs that they see out in the communities, and then they can be a sounding board to you as well. So with that, um, I believe we have some additional callers here in a bit, so um, I, we're open for questions, we're open for a discussion or dialogue, 
and uh, fr from uh, the commissioners. So please, please uh, let us know if you have any questions. And I just want to thank all of our presenters today so, so much um, for joining us from all across the country. Uh, this is Commissioner Slatton Hodges from the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And, and I would just um, want to make a comment to make sure that we uh, don't, through this, duplicate work that has been um, uh, blessed for many years. We have a Children's State Advisory Work Group, which has a parent voice on that. And I think so kind of cross-looking at, at that work, as well as Department of Mental Health um, partners with um, the Evolution Foundation in Oklahoma, and the Evolution Foundation is um, an organization that does a lot of key work around parent voice um, throughout our state and throughout our children and parent programs. They also have um, a part of the work that they do is leadership training to parents so that they can better have a voice um and um has kind of a ready group of folks to be able to speak at different events and organizations so i would really want to look at how the how we are not duplicating but um reinforcing in addition i would say that these folks may not realize is that one of the things as a state that we have done and continue to do is uh, uh, family support providers are actually a compensated service, both from the Department of Mental Health and our Medicaid agency, where um, when you have a family team to support uh, families, which is part of the evidence-based work that we do, a family support provider is part of those teams and works with families to share their lived experience and how they navigate the system. And that's something that's long been compensable in Oklahoma. And I think it's somewhat unique in that. And then in addition, we do also have staff at our agency that are a family, uh, our parents with lived experience to um, work with all of our programming and make sure that those voices are there. So I would encourage um, cross collaboration um in that and um certainly i am at the ready to have any of those staff available to work with partner with share with the work that has been ongoing adrian do you want to talk about some of the work you've done with the children's work group um state work group yeah or Annette, and I believe our folks, Annette, I'm sorry for jumping in. This is Shamika. Our folks are also a part of working with um, the partnership group as they begin to design and develop uh, for the commission. So very good. Thank yeah. you, Shamika. I did. Yes, we, we have been involved. I know Jerry and Acela has participated in some of the conversations and work that's been going on. Uh, with the commission and Adrian is involved in the state advisory team. And so again, we want to continue to collaborate and work with the commission as they develop and build out the partnership board, uh, specifically around the uh, custody um, families and kids. And so uh, again, um, I'll let Adrian uh, chime in. And That's great. I just wanted to make sure um, that we all knew, because I know a couple of the comments were that our state is new to this and i just wanted to make sure that people knew that we have done a lot of work um, in this area through the years and so we'll be building on that work very good thank yeah, you absolutely yeah I, this is adrian just to, to echo that um there has been such great work in this area and how we um kind of acknowledge that foundation and continue to build on that mm -hmm. um, some recent highlights um as Shamika and Carrie said, with the state advisory team and the children's uh, state agency work group, um, you know, there's a lot of great conversations happening around how to increase that coordination and include family voice and and um, and expanding, you know, family voice. And so, one one recent highlight has been we did a training that we had about 13 people from across agencies that attended the National Family Support Network. Um, training for parent advisory councils. And so I think, you know, a lot of that is, you know, some people have been doing this for decades, um, other agencies are new, and how we can help facilitate that shared language and shared understanding. And again, just the, the guidance from the Children's Trust Fund Alliance 
um, with Meryl and Kara and Michael, um, again, has just been extremely invaluable as we um, kind of build templates and share with each other. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, um, right? Using what's already working, uh, fine tuning that process. And so, um, you know, appreciate the support from multiple ag agencies. Well, and I think the good news in um, having selected Adrienne as uh, the individual to kind of coordinate and work on this is that she's very familiar with the work that we've done. Thank you. I could say for the Office of Juvenile Affairs, we have a state advisory group and youth emerging leaders as part of that. And their mantra is nothing about us without us. So we're bringing youth voice to the juvenile justice mm -hmm. space. Just certainly we know that the better family engagement is, the better the outcomes are for the kids and families in the future. So I appreciate this discussion for the ongoing efforts of it. I love that, Rachel. Great. Any other questions or comments? Awesome. I think, yeah, great progress is being made recognizing the work that's been done in the state and the importance of cross-sector collaboration is, is important moving forward. Um, I, I know we had a couple of new folks join and Shamika just spoke up, but I would love it if Shamika, would you mind introducing yourself for the group? Uh, yes, I'm Shamika Williams. I'm the Director of Children's Services at the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And guys, I do apologize that I'm on. I'm only on um, voice because I'm actually on my way to Oklahoma City to the office. And so I'm happy to be here and happy to be a part of the group um, as I continue to rep represent the Department of Mental Health. Thank you, Shamika. And I believe former Commissioner um, Sid Brown also joined. Sid, if you're still on, would you mind introducing yourself? I don't know. Sid may have already left. Okay. Is there any anybody else who's joined that has not had an opportunity to introduce themselves? I'm sorry. I had to punch my little green button there. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I'm still with you. I was a little bit late getting there this morning. Uh, it seems like a full day of meetings, but I'm still uh, still doing director of criminal justice at. Uh, Oklahoma Christian University, and we're getting ready to do some dialogue with many of the uh, emerging Votech schools in terms of uh, uh, criminal, justice, criminal justice education. So that's a new happening for me. But nice to see all of you and very interesting program presented. Thank you, Sid. All right, we'll continue down our agenda. Um, Agenda item number nine, um, Ms. Jennifer Hardin with um, OCCY's Legislative Liaison. Would you provide us with an update, please? Yes. Can you can you guys hear and see me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I will be brief so we can get on with the meeting. Um, let's see, I'll start out with our request bill, Senate Bill 537. Unfortunately, it was not heard in committee and it's dormant pursuant to the rules. Um, there was just so many um, bills left over from last session that didn't make it. Plus we had new bills um, to address what happened in the last year. Or so um, Senator Racino said he just didn't have time to run it. And that would have been, that was our OCCY administration bill. It was gonna shore up a few things. Um, it was gonna add a commissioner that's um, knowledgeable in the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, it was going to have the commissioner terms coincide with the fiscal year. Um, it was going to amend the, um, the PAR board membership from three to five years. Um, so it was just, like I said, tying up some loose ends here and there. Um, but Senator Racino has indicated that he's going to um, run it again next year. So hopefully we'll get it through then. Um, the rest of the bills are... Um, going along great. Um, House Bill 2311, which establishes standards and requirements for the detention of youth offenders in adult correctional facilities. That has passed um, the House and has been received in the Senate. House Bill 2312 permits the Office of Juvenile Affairs to raise the issue of a child's competency at any time prior to or during a delinquency of youthful offenders. 
and that's um, passed House and has been received in the Senate. And then we have House Bill 2313 that directs our oversight division to conduct periodic inspections and requires that the office have access to child care facilities for site visits and direct communication with residents. That's passed the House with flying colors and has been received in the Senate. And then we have House Bill 2317 that directs OCCY to administer a grievance process to be utilized by children detained in certain adult facilities. That is um, now in the Senate. And let's see, we have Senate Bill 987, which is going to clarify statutes so that um, the court to know that they can order that a child be interviewed during a, a child abuse investigation and the court can also order transportation to the interview. So that has um, passed through the Senate and is heading to the House. And then we signed on to support um, House Bill 2742. Um, that is a, the seatbelt bill um, that was going that would require children ages eight to 17 be seat belted in the back. Unfortunately, that did not get heard and make it off the house floor. However, we there was Senate Bill 339 that um, it's basically the same bill that did pass off the Senate floor and it's heading to the house. So um, good news about that. And so that's that's my report in a nutshell. Thank you, Ms. Harden. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. I see that Secretary Brown joined us. Thank you, Secretary Brown. Would you mind introducing yourself? Absolutely. Sorry, uh, sorry for being late, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, but uh, glad I can engage here. Thank you. I also show a caller seven. Um, caller seven, would you mind coming off mute and introducing yourself? Caller seven, I think we can hear you, but um, would you mind sharing your name? Okay, maybe they'll come on in a moment. Excellent, all right, moving on to agenda item number 10, we have um, Director Jacoby, um, would you provide an update on OCCY's infrastructure report? You bet. So I wanted to go over quickly with you, and some of this is in your packet or in my director's report, I should say. I'm going to try to share a screen here. Um, do you see a screen that says the 2020 Oklahoma State Employee Engagement Survey? Yes. Okay, good. All right, super. Um, so I wanted to quickly tell you that um, similar to what DHS has done with True North, and I think we've all uh, watched how useful that is right and and how having good strong indicators of where you are and where you're trying to get to um, it's incredibly important and so OCCY is a, has struggled with database issues and being able to collect information the way I think a lot of us would want and we're going to work towards making changes for that so all this to say is we have hired some consultants and some have been free and didn't cost us anything to assist us in a lot of process and what we're calling infrastructure work. First and foremost, mission and vision. So in your commission handbook, we used to have in the very front our mission and vision statements, and they're not really on point. And I don't even know if they fit the definition of mission and vision. So we have engaged with Dr. Mike Stout from Oklahoma State University, and he's going to assist not only the agency, but also each department in coming up with their own mission and vision statement. He's also then going to uh, continue that work into creating logic models for the departments and then our individual kind of activities that don't have full time staff on, uh, devoted to them. So we should be able to get out of those logic models uh, 
better measurements, things that we want to, to be able to show the public, show policymakers that we're doing. I think you all have probably gotten the sense we're a small, small agency um, that everyone is very busy. I have no doubt everyone's busy. What I can't tell you with perfect uh, accuracy is what is the value added? So in our busyness, what are we adding to the state of Oklahoma of value? And I think this process will help us get there. So logic models, and then one thing that I wanna thank uh, Secretary Brown and Department of Human Services is they are lending their expertise around the area of process mapping out of their innovation team. So we have staff now who are going to help us uh, decide what processes are really working effectively and efficiently, and then what can we do to maybe make tweaks so they could uh, work better. I'm going to tell you, we have some departments that are working on paper and pencil, and it's 2021. And sometimes that's been a, a problem because of lack of resources. We just haven't had the money to, to either develop uh, web-based systems where people can connect to, or we don't have the equipment, or we just haven't had uh, the ability to develop those kinds of um, infrastructure sets, really. And so we're moving forward. And thank you, Secretary Brown, for your assistance in that. And then last but not least, I wanted to walk you through another uh, process that every state agency went through, but I'm just going to be really transparent and show you the results of our Oklahoma State Employee Engagement Survey. Um, some of these results are, are, I think, really good. Some of them are, you know, challenging and we need to work on it. So I'm just going to share with you what the results are in kind of a highlight format. We have uh, asked the Office of Accountability out of Secretary John Budd's office to assist us with focus groups so that not only do we get these results, but really dig a little deeper and ask staff to expound on some of these responses so that we know best how to fix some of these situations um, or at least make improvements. So quickly, we had about 80% of our staff respond to the client and uh, the employee engagement survey. I'm gonna flip through and just show you some of the slides that are easier to see. These are our top rated items. And I will say we scored very well in our cabinet. I think we had some of the highest improvement rates, if not the highest improvement rates. But I think it's based on one category and we'll talk about that. Um, and so while I want to go yay us, I also think that uh, the pandemic probably lent itself to some changes in the way we do business that made some staff very happy. And perhaps that is our big leap. So we'll talk about that. First and foremost, um, we scored well in the health and safety conditions of our workplace. Uh, they staff feel like they they understand how their work contributes to the agency goals. We rank very high in that. They also believe that executive leadership cares about them as a person. They feel like their direct supervisor listens and tries to help them with their problems and complaints. And they understand the agency's uh, mission and goals. So I feel good about those. Here's where we scored the lowest and where um, we have challenges. Some of these challenges I think are due to being a small agency. And when you see these, you'll probably understand why. Uh, the work, uh, there is a work culture at my agency that embraces accountability. So that didn't score super high. Um, the pay rate for my job has been properly set. That's pretty low. Um, pay increases are administered fairly. I believe results in the survey will be used to make my agency better. And then our lowest score is there's good opportunities at my agency to advance to a better job. And again, I think it's because we really just don't have that many that many layers in our agency. And so unless someone leaves, there's not a lot of opportunity for advancement. Uh, if you break apart um, the data, uh, it looks, you know, there's fairly equal. Oddly enough, it seems like men were uh, rated higher, the engagements, uh, the indicators in the engagement survey than women. But for the most part, there's not a lot of difference. Um, and I'm going to flip through, um, I'm going to, I don't think we have a slide for this. I'm going to tell you the three areas that we worked on, uh, that we chose to, uh, concentrate on for our, our improvement plan. And that's to, that we want to work on executive leadership, clearly communicating goals, 
uh, that's something that uh, we believe all this infrastructure work will hopefully help with. In addition, policies and work rules are administered fairly. That's an area that we've also chosen. We have very outdated policies and procedures, and we've started to work on that, but I think that will help immensely. And last but not least, um, a category that contributed perhaps to some negative numbers was uh, my supervisor serves as a mentor for me. And again, I think uh, we can really work on the supervisory capabilities of staff and kind of the collegiality of, of our environment. So we're gonna work towards that. We saw improvements and um, some pretty big improvements. Uh, overall, we had a 9.9 .9 positive change in just engagement. We had an increase of 7.2 for satisfaction with their job. And this is where we had a big, big leap, um, intent to stay. We we moved in the direction, uh, positive direction by 27 and a half percent. I don't know exactly what the, what the reasoning behind that was. Unfortunately, we meet with Office of Accountability this afternoon to learn more about some of those responses. But I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that um, more than likely teleworking, the opportunity to telework for a lot of staff contributed to their satisfaction at, in their work. And um, I think that we, I, I'm just going to make that guess. That's a very strong um, improvement. That has not been something we've done in the past. And this survey was taken in the September, October period. So people had had the opportunity to telework for about six and seven months. And I just think that that was a big deal to a lot of folks. We offered that prior to the pandemic when we were making the physical move to a new office. About half of our staff chose to telework permanently prior to the pandemic being on our radar. So um, I, I'm gonna guess that that is one of the reasons for that leap. Um, probably like a lot of you, we have some staff that love teleworking, and I think we also have some staff that really don't enjoy teleworking. So hopefully in the next month or two, we can get, get that kind of shift made so that people who want to come back to the office can do it, feel good about it, and those who want to continue teleworking will move forward with it and continue to be happy. So with that, I'm open for any kind of questions, but I just wanted to share with you that we really are working on ourselves and looking, uh, I think the pandemic has kind of given everybody an opportunity to reflect about what's important in your life, personally and professionally, and how are things rocking and rolling in your world. And so I think that's, that's one of the things we've done as an agency. So we're gonna take some time to really do a reset on some of these items. So happy for any questions. Uh, thankful for the assistance, uh, so much assistance outside of our agency because we couldn't do it without you. And that's, that's all. Thank you, Director Jacoby. I, th I, I agree with you that I think a lot of this infrastructure work will have a direct impact on some of those low, low performing scores. But I think I heard you say that, um, you know, I didn't hear that compensation is an area in which you're trying to focus. I'm assuming that that's because of the, the restrictions in which that you can offer pay uh, as a state agency. And, and if so, can you elaborate on that? That's a great point. So yes, so we are like, you know, state agencies at the moment, most of our staff are classified, which means they're in merit positions and they're in job classifications that have ranges. Um, and that is something we need to look at. We have looked at equity across the board a couple of years ago, but that doesn't mean just because people are equal, they could be equally paid low. <laughs> so, so that is something that needs to be addressed. I think that there is movement across the state to look at both the merit system and perhaps pay but we are part of the state system and and it is something we have to look into but we may not have the flexibility that people in the private sector would have thank you commissioners do you all have any other questions for uh, director jacoby Okay. Do you want to move on to your report? Sure. I'm just going to um, highlight a couple things because I did uh, write up a report. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the budget hearings because um, I think it's important, especially for those of you who are new, um, to understand kind of this process. So 
we go to the Capitol and uh, share our budget request with both the House and the Senate uh, separately. And the other commissioners here who are directors of agencies do the same. And I will tell you that in the past, we've had a fairly, I, I don't know if easy is the right word, but you know, simple to answer and, and pleasant hearings. And I, I would say that would have been true for the House this year. We did struggle a little bit in the Senate and I'm gonna, and I, I tried to write this up and I just wanna elaborate a little bit. Um, we use, a, all of us are given a worksheet that we have to complete. And then that document is shared with all the members. Uh, we followed it the way we believed made sense. And so for those who've been on for a while, we have been pulling away money for a database because we just don't have a comprehensive database that both lends itself to capturing narrative on case reviews and such, but also allows for analysis. It's a really antiquated system. And most of our departments have their own individual little database some of them not even going to be maintained in the future by OMES because they're so old. So we learned last year that what we had saved was not enough. So we've been stockpiling any kind of lapse in salary or any other kind of funding and put it there. We distributed those monies on that worksheet by department, making a guess how much it, their share of the database would cost. That caused confusion because there was no explanation uh, box where you could explain right there by those distributions how that money was to be used we did put further in the document that we were going to use our carry forward money for a database but i don't think the senators made those connections so they were a little frustrated and thought that perhaps i was trying to sprinkle money throughout the document so it wouldn't be seen that i had so much carryover and i just want to say i've told you we have a lot of carryover we presented our carryover to you and i don't want you to ever feel like we're trying to hide money from you or anyone at the capitol and um and i think we got that cleared up but it was i think just a miscommunication on how we utilize the the worksheet but it made for kind of an uncomfortable hearing for a few minutes and i just want to tell you that because i haven't had that experience it was online we had the opportunity to have a virtual meeting i'm sure it was recorded but i as as being responsible to you about how we use money and what we're setting money for uh, setting aside money for just want to be perfectly clear so that you don't get caught off guard being responsible somewhat for our budgets as well. And um, I want you to know that there are plans for those funds. Um, we have made, I think, significant movement thanks to Mark James. Uh, OMES has had our request for migration of this data and a data system since 2019. We started making some good headway and then the pandemic came and poor OMES just had to shift all their focus to getting people to telework. So our request just dropped to the bottom again. They're back and uh, Mark has worked with them and Todd Miggs and I, kudos to them. Um, hopefully we're gonna have a vendor here, whether it's OMES or someone on the outside to start making this happen. Um, and hopefully we'll see some big improvements before June 30th, that's our goal. So I just wanna be really upfront with you because I try to be a transparent book about our work and our funding. And if you ever have any questions, please let me know. Uh, does anyone have any questions on that particular item? Okay. Um, and then I want to highlight one other area because I, Mark James and I made a ton of phone calls uh, during the snowstorm. And I want to give a shout out. I, if Commissioner Bloomer is still on the call, I bothered her during the snowstorm. Um, uh, I bothered Rachel Holt. Actually, she came up and just told me what was going on in her shop. I just want to remind everyone that when things go awry due to power outages and water problems and weather in these extreme weather conditions, we have kids in care that are being, you know, let's just be honest, they're being detained somewhere and they can't leave. They can't get out of that situation. So. We knew that Oklahoma County was the Oklahoma County Jail was struggling with uh, uh, heat and water, and once we learned that, then I just want to say uh, Judge Stenson was very, very quick to help us review. Or we didn't review, but she reviewed the nine miners that were there and wanted to see if any of them could be transferred to the Oklahoma County uh, Juvenile Detention 
Center. I know Director Holt had issues down in uh, at Swojack. Was that, was that where it was? Yes. And so she had kids there and it wasn't about her facility alone. The whole county didn't have water. And so she had to work to get water, what, bottled water. And she got baby wipes or some kind of wipes so the kids could wipe themselves down because showers weren't available. She was going to another town to make sure they could do laundry. I just want you to know that if you are aware of a situation like that, we are happy to be the squeaky wheel. Not are we happy, it is our responsibility to be the squeaky wheel. Um, so uh, please let us know if you're worried about kids somewhere in a situation like that, because we don't mind uh, trying to track down someone who can make some decisions and perhaps improve those situations. So uh, I wanted to highlight that. And thank you to everybody who worked so hard because those were ex really extreme and extenuating circumstances. And I appreciated everyone um, working into crazy hours and trying to think of creative ways to make sure kids were uh, warm and they had water and they weren't in um, a dire public health situation. So thank you so, so much. Um, I touched on the database work a little bit because that goes hand in hand with the infrastructure. And other than that, I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Does anybody else have questions? All right. Thank you, Director Jacoby. And I do want to express gratitude to our commissioners who do lead agencies um, during times and for their leadership um, during those critical times. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number 12, new business. Do we have any new business from commissioners? No? Okay. How about commissioner announcements, report only? Not seeing anybody coming off mute. Okay, we'll move on to my remarks. Um, just briefly, I'd like to make the commissioners aware that we'll be doing Director Jacoby's annual performance review, um, and we'll be seeking input from current and um, recent past commissioners via an online survey. This will be coordinated through the personnel committee. So I encourage those of you who have an interest in human resources or experience in um, conducting performance reviews to please join the personnel committee. We will have a report out during the May meeting, um, at which time we'll enter executive session to review the result of Director Jacoby's review. So please be on the lookout um, in your email to, for that and provide input. During the September OCCY meeting, we heard from several members of the public about the inequities in the child serving systems. We also heard from then Commissioner Lee Rowland about what it means to be a socially responsible leader and the importance of cultural competency. The Parent Partnership Board is a step in the right direction to ad address, in address equality, but we can't stop there. This body needs to be leaning into these conversations and I hope we continue to listen learn and take action as necessary and appropriate. Finally, I would like to thank, uh, take this opportunity to formally thank past commissioners, Lee Rowland, Javier Ramirez, Angela Donnelly, and Cheryl Marseille, since we did not have an opportunity to express our appreciation and gratitude for their services uh, prior to their departure. Our next meeting is Friday, May 21st, 2021 at 9 a.m. That brings us to the um, end of our meeting. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you all. We do not need to vote, so we are officially adjourned. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.